Then there's oxytocin, which is the hormone related to social circuitry. And it's not to make you feel good and fuzzy, but it's released when you're on your computer. You treat your computer like you treat a person. You go to a website and they slap you around. You have the same oxytocin profiles. My name is Ben Charland, and you're listening to What on Earth is Going On. My guest this week is David Chandros, a researcher of gamification, mixed reality, healthcare, and learning based in Toronto. David has studied neuroscience as well as the history of ideas and how they evolve over time. And one of his current focuses is on the use of games to treat addiction. Now, in this conversation, we talk a lot about games, virtual reality, mixed realities, augmented reality, and the use of these things not just to have fun in the game world or the open world simulation, but to learn skills, to develop knowledge, and of course to treat certain ailments. We talk about gamification, open world simulations, being analog and the importance of being analog in the digital world, Dungeons and Dragons, the ludic arts or the gaming arts, having been with us through history, hormones and neuroscience in which David is an expert, something called default mode thinking. Towards the end, we talk about identity politics, Trump and the alt-right, and the current state of our democracy and our civil society. This is a really fascinating conversation that I've had with David, and I hope you take the time not just to listen, but to let me know what you think of this conversation or of any other. You can go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca, and find all previous episodes as well as this one, and a way to get in touch with me on social media or by email. Let me know what you think, send me your feedback, and give me your suggestions for future episodes, whether that's a guest or a topic that you'd like to be discussed. Finally, if you can, go to Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app that you use and give it a rating or a review. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. All right, David Chandros, welcome to the program. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, just before we started, we were getting to your, your title, your position. Do you want to say it for us? Because it's a mouthful for sure. me. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm currently a scholar in residence at the Inclusive Design and Media Lab at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University. And for the past six years, I've been the program coordinator uh, for uh, outreach programs and seniors education at Ryerson. Right. Um, one of the reasons I'm really excited to talk to you is about gamification. Uh, and gamification in learning, gamification for aging, uh, gamification in our daily lives and how that interacts with virtual reality, augmented reality. There's so many different things that we can talk about. But David, as you know, the first question on this program is always the same, and that goes to you, and it's deliberately broad for a deliberately broad response. You can take this anywhere you like. So, David, what on earth is going on? Well, currently, uh, I do a lot of work in the area of gamification. I've been in the field since about uh, 1996. Um, as such, I'm probably one of the founders of the field, but the field didn't have founders. It had uh, people that named it, and, and we, I think we were all working on very similar things in different parts of the world and really not speaking because the internet in 1996 was, uh, you know, haze compatible modems. I remember um, it. It was an exciting time, but it was a, a very different time than it is now. Very different, um, not very connected. And um, so uh, the, I, I, I've been with the field a long time and uh, my interest has always remained and it's continues to remain in the area of simulation gamification. So um, there are a number of game designs that I build, uh, and some of them don't involve simulations, but almost all of them involve some element of simulation. And so this is um, derived from a lot of the work uh, that's gone on in the area of problem-based learning from McMaster uh, Medi University Medical School starting in 1967, where they decided that they would stop uh, using lectures. So you start in the first week of medical school seeing real and simulated cases, and your entire four-year medical curriculum is simply seeing cases in a group, whether virtual or with an actor or text or real, and then you get together as a group uh, with a tutor kind of overseeing it, and you decide, what do I know? What do I think my hypothesis about what's wrong with the patient? What would I have to learn in order to bridge the gap between don't want to know and, and know? And then there's an iterative process where people then go away, they do reading, they do some researching, they come back together and say, okay, let's use the case as a stimulus for learning. 
So if it's a heart attack case, the problem, the, the case is not really about solving the heart attack or diagnosing it. It's not a direct simulation. It's using the problem as a generation for learning. So what I do is I've brought that element together with what I call autopoietic hyperreality, and that's the area that I'm currently working on. And I'm sure the next question will be is, <laughs> what is that? Yeah, sure. Let's. Ma I, I actually had a different question, which was... Please. Um, um, when we talk about gamification, is are we talking about something similar to playing Monopoly? I mean, is, is it similar? Because I know that another word for this is serious gaming. Right. So is, is this what we're talking about? Is it related or we should, we, should we try to separate these ideas? There's a plethora of definitions that are in constant. So gamification is simply applying anything that we find entertaining about games, whether board games or video games, to uh, something other than entertainment. So we've done work in addiction. So where we make addiction recovery a game process, a gameful process. Um, then there is game, serious games, which is kind of the same thing. It really means the same thing. Uh, then there's game-based learning. And game-based learning is where you take these technologies and use them for learning. So you would say that I work in the area of game-based learning. Um, so that would sort of lay it out. And these definitions have been around since maybe 2010 uh, and are used throughout the industry. And... Uh, so the, the newest development, uh, the area that I'm interested in, and, and a number of other people like Walter Greenleaf in the United States and others are starting to work on is open world simulation gamification. So essentially you're in an alternate reality during your learning. And what I push for and is, is, has got some traction is the idea of job rehearsal skills in the game world. So I put you in a virtual construction site and you have to be a construction worker or an engineer or a doctor, whatever you are in whatever setting. And as you do it, we gamify that so there's a feeling of progress and achievement and benchmarking and engagement. But you're essentially rehearsing what we want you to do in the job in the game world. So there's an important word, word I've introduced here that comes from people like David Kaufman at Simon Fraser University, which is probably one of the top game researchers in the world. He's just retiring. He's in his slow two or three year retirement phase. Um, but uh, game worlds are alternate realities, much like this online game Second Life. There's, a, there's a, an experience that you're not really playing a game. There's no winning or lose conditions. You're simply in an alternate reality called a game world. And within that game world, you can play the part of an avatar. And that avatar represents you in the game world. And the avatar can be imbued with certain abilities. And then the avatar could even have specializations. So we're talking about, in autopoietic hyperreality, I'm talking about autopoietic means self-generating. So you create a world where emergent learning can happen. You have no idea really what's going to happen in the learning. And I do this by populating what are called domains of knowledge with attractor regions. And this comes from some of the idea in chaos theory and some of the area in, 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 in a big, a big science and big data. So if I want you to learn a lot about the heart and the lungs, I could create a number of simulations about heart and lung disease, populate them in that world. As you work through those, you would master that domain. So we could have clusters of, of epistemologically related uh, elements. Fascinating. I, part of the reason I'm so excited for this conversation is I myself am really interested in games. I'm getting married in August and my fiance and I have put together a wedding registry almost that we were forced to and half of the items on there are board games. Um, and I know you've talked before about how being analog is really important in the digital age when it comes to gaming and sometimes the best games have cards and posters and really simple rule sets to follow as opposed to what we assume gamification means which is this extreme digital world creating where i'm where the world is so much more complex than i am but i also find it interesting because you know playing games for me i was a big video gamer as a kid it, it really is part of the definition of who I am just because I played so much of it. Um, and I saw the other day a post on social media that was saying, you know, how to use Dungeons and Dragons on your resume. And it was essentially saying, take out that it's D&D &D, and it put, been put in, I met weekly with friends to develop conflict resolution skills mm -hmm. and how to solve problems collaboratively and so on and so forth. And it was really interesting because that's true. As much as we might think of these games as entertainment or think of them as a waste of time or just something you do with your friends they're actually skill developing whether we like it or not and they may develop good skills or bad skills and i think that there's this 
paradigm shift that we're going through right now with games and gamification where we're understanding that this isn't just something we do in our spare time. This is the way that we perceive the world. And I don't know if you agree with this, but to me, playing games is fundamental to being human. I think that one of the reasons that human beings tell stories, go to see theater or watch a film, is to enact actions that we don't have to suffer the consequences for that we would in normal life. And a game, like you were just saying, in a game world, allows us to do that in a similar way. Do you think that gaming is as fundamentally human as I've described it, or or not, David? Well, um, I tend to think of the world in a different way than that. Um, I teach courses, one of the courses I teach, I teach quite a bit at the university. I like the process of teaching. Um, and one of the courses I teach is on positive psychology. And that goes beyond Seligman is the founder of that field. Psychology was developed to treat pathologies by Sigmund Freud and later by Carl Jung and the post-Freudian modernists. But a new field, of course, started to develop in the 70s and gain momentum up until the present day based on PERMA, which is based on... It's, it's, it involves St. Macaulay's flow theory, St. Macaulay and Nakamura's work in flow theory. It also has to do with how we interact with each other. Um, if I get a great accomplishment in my life, I, make a, I get a great new job, and you respond by saying, that's great, but don't blow all your money in one place. These are negative. They actually rewire our circuitry, whereas the way you should respond to that is, that's great. I'm so happy for you. That actually produces changes in brain chemistry. So I'm interested in uh, not game design per se, and it, we call it game of because you need a word for everything, but it's emotional painting. Hmm. It's actually painting an emotional canvas because we're primarily emotional beings. There's a book by Sapolsky that was a bestseller, came out in May 2017 called Behave. And it's a fundamental textbook in the area of behavioral neuroscience. So I tend to think about uh, creating an emotional canvas. And the way we can do that is look at uh, what's core to the human experience and our fundamental drives, which gets back to your points of ludus, the ludic arts or game arts, having been with us through history. But I'm interested in what drives that ludic urge. And um, part of, part Bartle's work on the different player types was quite illuminating. These applied, of course, to multiplayer dungeons. But I've adapted them in my... And that is that people would play games or have a game-like experience to either achieve something to compete with each other, to socially connect, or to explore. So I call that model ACES, achievement, um, competition, uh, exploration, social connectedness. So I'm building curriculum using those principles. And plus, we know a good deal about the neuroscience of what happens during game conditions. Um, there's some work that's fundamental to understanding this, I believe, beyond the work about dopaminergic cycles, dopamine drips, where dopamine, we're built primarily as human beings to expect the next best thing. When we get it, be dissatisfied and find the next best thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't survive in, in Neolithic times. So this, this kind of chemistry about it. So it means, you know, you can go to a casino and keep hitting that bar because of the dopamine cycle. There's another chemical, serotonin, which is involved with self-satisfaction and self-soothing. So the feeling of inner peace you get and flow is probably serotonergic. And serotonin goes very deep. There's a lot of physiology on serotonin and how we see the world. There's the 5-H2A receptor, which is stimulated by psilocybin and lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD. And this work is being conducted at John Hopkins and Harvard and MAPS. It's, 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 the psychedelic research is quite strong. And connecting this, when the serotonin receptors are hit with psilocybin, and it's why it seems to be so effective for the treatment of depression, highly resistant depressive patients in two doses of psilocybin, magic mushrooms, are experiencing full recoveries up to a year later. And wow. this is at Johns Hopkins. This is not fooling around. Um, so that serotonergic receptor seems to give us an infant mind, which is the ability to reconceptualize or reframe the world. In this case, depression is seen as part of the cycle of life of yin and yang, that there is good light and dark. And through things like humor, you can inhabit light, but still acknowledge that dark exists. This is how these recoveries happen. Are we talking here about neuroplasticity, the ability to, as you just said, have the mind of an infant and rediscover the world? As Re if you rediscover, were. although neuroplasticity is, is a very specific term related to neurite dendrite uh, growth that happens in the brain and remodeling uh, and those uh, haven't those have been studied with respect to game research and there's a whole literature on, on neuroplasticity in gaming um, then there's oxytocin which is the hormone related to social circuitry 
And it's not to make you feel good and fuzzy, but it's released when you're on your computer. You treat your computer like you treat a person. You go to a website and they slap you around. You have the same oxytocin profiles. There are other chemicals such as cortisol, um, uh, estrogen. There's a plasma and brain glucose levels, uh, estrogens, uh, testosterone, etc. But then there's another body of work which looks at functional magnetic resonant imaging. And this work of some of That's the most... That's fMRI, right? fMRI. Yeah. And this comes from the work of uh, Paul Howard Jones at Bristol. And he's quite f available on YouTube. He's quite a leader. And in his studies, he's shown that during game conditions, we have a deactivation of what are called default mode processors. So when we're in default mode thinking, we are wandering. And we want to be focused during learning. So when you compare the fMRI side by side of those who are doing quizzing versus game conditions, uh, there's much more spacing out in quizzing. And there's much more spacing out when you're doing self-study, when you're just reviewing the material on your own. During game conditions, your consciousness is focused. The other thing in his research that's interested, and then I'll give a pause because we, we, we give you a lot of meat here, <laughs> is that the ventral striatum, which is found near the basal ganglia, it's a part of the brain region that has usually been associated with motor, motor control. But we know that's the dopaminergic and reward systems of the brain. So there's an area called the ventral striatum, ventral meaning top and striatum meaning stripes it's a striped top and that is our reward learning center so if you buy a bottle of chardonnay and you say you know what i feel good when i drink it and i like it and i'd like that wine again that's a learning reward linkage you're linking the learning of, of the purchase of chardonnay with a specific emotional reward now those were only lit up in the fMRIs during game conditions they failed to light during self-conditioned and twisting so when we're in a game condition we have a mindfulness and that mindfulness is is focused, and um, that focused attention is 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 my interest. Engagement and emotional engagement is another part of the story. So there are several embedded layers within a, a game learning experience. And that makes so much sense to me when I'm playing a video game or a board game with friends or Dungeons and Dragons or something like that. There's a mindfulness and there's a focus almost as if I were playing a sport, almost as if I were following a puck with my stick, and I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm able to zone out all of the other things. And it's an addictive thing to be in. It's, it's a very powerful drug to be playing a game because the rest of the world is silent for a moment. But I want to go back to default mode thinking. And this is something that you wrote uh, not too long ago that I, I, maybe this is a generalization, but 80% of medical mistakes by doctors are because of default mode thinking. Uh, and um, if a doctor is looking at a patient about the same symptom over and over again, they will treat patients as categories, not examples. And that this is, and default mode thinking, we think, can be solved through artificial intelligence, obviously, is one way, but gamification of the process is another way. And I found that fascinating, almost as an antidote to automating all of our processes, is, not, is to de-automate us, in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and allow us to be mindful, whether we're doctors or nurses or, or not just in the medical field, in any field, to allow for mindfulness. And it's funny because many people have said, and this is going back years now, someone like Elon Musk has said that the future of education is to be gamified, that everything that you want to learn should be that easy so that you don't realize that you're learning, that you're actually just having fun, but you're still developing the skills like you would by hitting a controller when you're playing a Nintendo 64 or something. That's exciting to me, but it's also kind of insidious. You know, like the learning for me when I go to university or, or when I remember back to high school or whatever is a, is a conscious process where I know that this is what I'm engaged in. Is there a, is there a risk to make education so, or so, not subconscious, but so under the surface that we don't realize that we're being educated anymore, that it's more just almost base conditioning. Well, that could happen, but these are speculative Ready Player One type scenarios, right. which seldom pan out the way we think they will because of strange attractors. And strange attractors in technology are um, hit us out of the blue. There's suddenly a breakthrough in some area, and whatever logic you had collapses. So, what, sorry, what's a, an example of a strange attractor? Um, let's just say that Apple produces a new iPhone. You've de developed a marketing campaign to sell why and other things, and all of a sudden an iPhone comes out that has voice recognition with VR and augmented reality. Well, that would blow every other cell phone out of the water. Suddenly you're behind. So a strange attractor is uh, sort of unplanned chaotic events, like Jeff Goldblum talked about in Jurassic Park. Right, the chaos theory moment yeah. with the glass of water. Yeah. Is an example of, <laughs> of a strange attractor 
the idea that when they built the iPhone originally with a camera facing you as you face the screen, they originally thought that would be used for FaceTime when you call your grandmother and see each other face to face. And of course, nobody uses it for that. They use it for taking selfies. Right. It's become the selfie camera. Right. Um, is that a strange attractor? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So technology is, 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 is affected by strange attractors, developments and trends. But there's something bigger going on and the insidiousness lies in the smartphones from what we I, I've done massive I've been paid just to review literature at Humber College last year I was a visiting scholar in gamification and I had to amass the literature and, and repurpose it for VR and immersive tech um, games it appears are good for you it appears that there's more positive than negatives in, in games even violent video gaming uh, but it appears that smartphone use is related to a high incidence of depression and anxiety and panic disorder uh, in the Generation Z, which has various listings. It's generally ages 7 to 22 right now would be Gen Z. And Gen Z are purely digital native, and they're starting to find neuroanatomical changes occurring through cyberbullying, checking Facebook 30, 40 times a day, not getting likes on a post that means something to you, being hassled on social media, arguing with people on Facebook about politics. So the insidious nature there is not so much in the Chinese experiment, because the mm -hmm. Chinese now are trying to regulate social behavior. And have a social credit system. Social credit system. So those are, you know, not really what we're dealing with here very much. The real danger is digital technology and um, digital detoxification is a big interest I have. It's taken over and it's insidious and it, it's communication through digital technology is um, is not real communication. It, it, it is a, it uses semiotics and symbols and codes and text and media based reports, but it can't give me the reaction of your body language, even as you sit here in a podcast and I feel you respond. You and I are engaging in body language right. that we try to be aware of because our viewers can't see it. But as I see you nod or knowledge or maybe get fidgety or get enthusiastic, then <laughs> I, and then you and I perform a communication dance. Digital technology is not allowing this. Now, it might at some time in the future, but why would we do that when being together? So analog games are, are something I'm pushing for, where we use the learning management system as a repository of simulations and as a experience platform for Google Hangouts, Adobe Connect, etc., and that or Zoom. Uh, and then we use that to, to pull material that then we engage with face-to-face. And then how you scale that over an organization with 30,000 employees, it's not impossible. What's happened is people have defaulted to legacy online learning experiences, which basically repurpose a lecture as a text-based format. Now you don't even have the body language of the instructor as they emphasize certain words and ideas and questions from the audience. Going to class and hanging out with your buddies, going for coffee, making yeah. a new friend. So digital is a kind of a horrifying landscape. It's dystopian if it's not regulated. If it's regulated, it's our best friend. Well, one thing that I found for me when I did my, I did an undergraduate and then I did a master's degree. And in both contexts, what really, really influenced me was the passion of the people I was surrounded by. The passion of the professor, the passion of the student sitting next to me, the apathy of the other student in the room who I wanted to be different from. Uh, the passion of someone studying a subject I had no idea about on the other side of campus. That passion can come through in writing. We write things passionately all the time, but it's not the same. There's something visceral about someone standing in a lecture hall and, and essentially showing me, not telling me, but showing me how much they care. And there's, there's something appealing, almost viral about that, to use the expression, that I want some of it. Well, there's mirroring behaviors, and then there's the mentalizing region of the brain. We're discovering whole new operation sub-regions of the brain that we didn't know about. 20 years ago. And there's a mentalizing region near the frontal cortex that's close to an empathizing region. They're separate regions. There's also a fun and play region. And the fun and play region was discovered in rat experiments, um, tickling rats. And they actually have this hypersonic, almost like bat, a hyper uh, ultrasonic kind of laugh. And then they started to look at the parts of the brain that was responsible for. So laughter and playful experience is hard-coded. That's an enormous breakthrough. One cannot underestimate the importance of that, that, that fun and play and humor and, uh, is really a coded 
you know, purposeful biological function. Mentalizing, to get back to that, is the ability to see the world through the other person's eyes. And you can go off into empathy, but let's stay away from empathy because that's a different process. Empathy is uh, um, identifying with the person's emotions. Seeing the world through the eyes of a neurosurgeon is practiced their whole life. By, and then we have mirror neurons in the brain where we start to mirror. But this whole idea that we mentalize in, 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 in real life connection, if I'm around a karate master, I, I, I want to move like the master did. I want to respond. I, he watches me move and then he sees and then he sees that day. And then karate masters, they're quite amazing that you'll go in thinking about self-defense that day because you've been scared by some item you've heard in the news. And intuitively, the class will relate to that. And this is what I call an autopoietic structure, that the nature of consciousness itself is that there seems to be connectedness. Carl Jung called them synchronicities. There are unplanned, but to stay away from synchronicity and other quasi-metaphysical notions, there seems to be unplanned experiences that happen when we connect in real time. And digital language... Uh, forbids a lot of that. It, it, I, I write a text, I have to wait three days to get back to you, or I'm typing, then you type. You can only type what you can conceive of. You can only type what your fingers are capable of. Well, and, and moreover, it's, it's easy for me to not see you as human anymore if all you are represented as is text. And so we see this on Twitter. I mean, it's almost cliche to say now that it's so easy to hate everyone on Twitter and be a troll um, because you're not really dealing with other human beings. You're just dealing with other images on a screen or other ideas or avatars. In this room, you and I, we can disagree fundamentally about something, but I will still, I will have to respect you as a human being. I will have to recognize your fundamental existence yeah. and dignity as a human being. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there who don't. We see murder happen every day, but it's a lot, lot harder to do. Um, yeah, and social media is an amplifier. Not right. an echo chamber. Right. That's important to get rid of the echo chamber. It actually amplifies. But can I go back to this idea of mentalizing? Mm. Surely when you mentalize to that degree, like if I play a game where I'm acting as a neurosurgeon, but I do this maybe for a month, for eight hours a day, not only will I obviously understand the world from their perspective like I didn't before, but isn't empathy going to be a byproduct of that? Like I'm going to start to feel their feelings. I'm going to start to feel the things that they might feel in the surgery room or when they go home after a long day's work. I mean, are, I think, emp- I mean, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that empathy and mentalization are kind of two sides of the same coin. Yeah, they are. Um, but e- empathy is a very, very dangerous emotion. It led to the rise of the Third Reich. Right. We in Germany are oppressed. And then, Hitler was able to capture the feeling of a defeated German people. And it took him many years as the Germans resisted him and imprisoned him. But eventually he was able to arise this. So empathy is not the happy little emotion that we think it is. It's simply identification that can be used for heinous purposes. Um, Hmm. So mentalizing is an interesting, it's a region of the brain that seems to have a high level of neurotensin. A neurotensin is a hormone first uh, involved with a uh, axis of uh, appetite regulation with ghrelin, a complementary hormone. But it turns out, as with all hormones, that's the first use we found for it, but it's actually done 50 other things in the body. So neurotensin is a very interesting, it's that same region of the brain is involved in three-dimensional space recognition. So that mentalizing region also has neurons which would code for a VR immersion. Uh, Neurotensin levels drop precipitously in uh, dementia. Uh, They increase in the spinal cord, uh, in the spinal fluid during schizophrenic episodes, and they seem to be very involved in knowledge production. The endocannabinoids, um, of course, cannabis is legal in Canada now, so there's a good deal of research in medical cannabis that's becoming open. And there's endocannabinoid receptors throughout the brain. Endocannabinoids seem to regulate creativity and learning. Uh, And what they seem to do is an interesting function, and that is be able to take what we've learned, put it in the past, and say we've already learned that. So when people smoke weed, they inhibit some of these anandamide receptors that uh, endocannabinoids respond to. So you can see the same thing in new ways. Van Morrison said you should never say the same song twice. So it's popular with musicians and artists because you can get a whole new approach on the song you've been playing for five years and say, well, what if I put in a minor chord there? So there's all these interesting... They're subtler functions of the brain. They're not the gross functionality we learn in basic neuroscience. That This is the occipital lobe, that's where vision is, etc. There are these regions related to these game-like that, that we're interested in now. So we've covered a lot of landscape, I think, in, in that discussion. But 
human neuroscience certainly is evolving, and with it, gamification tries to keep up. But I think there's something very basic to play that we would talk about, the importance of play, but also using gamified elements for the wandering. So a good deal of the work in VR in surgery or is, uses augmented reality where they put the liver two centimeters higher than it normally is. Now the surgeon has to do a different surgical approach. And you can add game elements by uh, what's called um, challenge titration. And that is increasing the level of difficulty because flow theory is all about uh, you know, increasing difficulty as your skills increase so that you're challenged, but not over-challenged. So that we, we can gamify that, and the gamification allows achievement benchmarking. Hi, I, I missed it. I killed the last two patients, but I've saved the last three. Things are getting better. <laughs> and then there's analytics in digital or in, 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 in analog that are constantly telling you how the player is doing. So I don't need to give you exams if I'm seeing you perform an act and you're doing it better and better over time. There's no need for an exam. I've been able to witness your flow, and I can even burst learn as I see you fail and stumble. I can introduce different elements. Well, you, were, you used the word amplify earlier with social media, it seems like we're talking about the same thing now. Because when I'm learning something, I play it out in my mind. If I'm learning how to be a neurosurgeon, or if I'm learning how to play a particular game, or if I'm preparing to give a speech, or I'm preparing for this conversation, um, that I, I'm going to play things through in my head over and over to make sure that I'm prepared for all different outcomes. Again, going back to it, that's almost what we do when we see a film or, or see a play. We're seeing different outcomes so that hopefully we can do the same thing or not do the same thing. Uh, it's often talked about that with Greek theater, the whole idea was to accept death and fate, um, but also know how to avoid being an idiot in spite of that. Uh, but I want to go to addiction because I know you've done a lot of work with addiction and using gamification to deal with addiction. Um, my first question about this is, can, are, is social media and the internet that we're dealing with today, is that can that be classified as an addiction? I know yes. this is a debate in science, yes. but... I mean, there's Facebook depression, and that's a recognized. There's internet gaming disorder, IGD, and there's social media disorders that are associated with addiction, addictive behaviors because you want the dopaminergic hit of the Facebook connection, and so you keep hitting it. Um, so certainly that's a form of addiction. Um, what's interesting in our work in addiction, what we really did is we did a pretty heavy literature review and there's almost nobody doing work in it. There are people starting to work in that area. There's an FDA approved, I forget the name of the company, but there is an FDA pr pr approved uh, gaming app in use for addiction. And, and it, the name just escapes me, her name right now. Uh, that's a, a great startup in the States. What we did is we worked on uh, the fact that um, in the literature, uh, there's a high recidivism rate in addiction. That is, people keep coming back to addiction. They don't just cure it like a great Hollywood movie and now I'm over it like, tw you know, two weeks with Sandra yeah. Bullock. Um, this is one of these things that after people have ceased drug use, in this case, opiate use, uh, their lives are very broken still. So you can see people with high degrees of agoraphobia, afraid to go out, even though they've stopped using for two or three years. Uh, and then a blame cycle that is, is common to the addict mind, which is where every job they take is another son of a bitch boss that they have to uh, quit. And they quit after six weeks in a rage, saying they'll not work in that damn shithole again. Like it's, it's a very, I use these explicatives because of the severe nature of addictive behavior. So what we began to do was look at harm reduction strategy through gamification. It came about from the idea that there's what's called a carry level in opiate dependence and methadone treatment. And that is, uh, you have to go in every day for methadone. Um, but if, if you uh, can prove that your urines are clean for like a month, then they say, okay, one day a week, you can take some methadone home with you and you don't have to come in that day. That's called the carry level. And over a series of months, carry levels are adjusted as your urine stays clean. They can eventually get to the point where you're in once a week and you're doing your own methadone treatment. So that's game-like in itself. So we began to then build upon dividing uh, different life categories and different quests. And we've gone quite a way since then in terms of life change game de design and development. So it, you would get uh, certain points. So we actually produced a board game. So what we did is we brought in groups of adolescents. That was our target, is adolescent addiction. And then we had them look at our game design and, and comment on it. And they all wanted, a, it was a board game, very much like D&D. &D, and they all wanted a strong game element. They didn't want it to be like a whole series of goals that you get badges for. They wanted to really play a game with a great storyline that gave them a reason to play. So our role was to make a compelling solo board game experience 
with battles and fighting and everything you'd want in a really good um, role-playing game. But it's all linked to points. So I can only buy the weapons I want if I've signed off and doing a week of Pilates and maybe one I meditated for three. And so there's different versions of the game. One is your self-honesty version. So you want to lie and cheat and say you got 1,000 points, go ahead and break the game. But if you actually want to recover, then play the game. And then there's verifi verified games where they, they would need some note that, yes, we saw them, they showed up at hip-hop classes for a week, or they went and they got a liver scan. So this idea of combining real-world with the game. And for that, we use a principle I call semiotic resonance. And that is that you resonate with the symbols in the game because they connect with your, with your own life. So we chose a theme to the game about being imprisoned and breaking out of prisons and leading a rebellion as a, as a, as a metaphor for the addiction process. Something that David has said so far that stuck with me was this idea that in the game world, we can rehearse what we want to do in, say, a real-world job experience, but we can do it over and over again to develop and learn the skills that we're going to need in the future, rather than practicing, say, on a live patient. Now, coming up in this discussion is this key word that has come up in many conversations up till now, and that is disruption. David, interestingly, sees disruption and disruptors as an important part of depolarizing people, maybe the opposite of what we would think or counterintuitive to what we would assume. But actually, disruption may help us become united. It may push us out of our comfort zones and may help us understand what we share in common. All that's coming up on this episode of What on Earth is Going On. It sounds like story is a really big part of gamification Absolutely. and something that we might fail to recognize. I mean, when we think of the game Monopoly or chess, for example, most people probably wouldn't consider story as being part of it. But anyone who plays, I mean, I don't know if anyone plays Monopoly professionally, but chess players see it as a story. There's a story with the other player. There's the backstory of the thousands and thousands of games that they've had to if not memorize, at least study before. There are stories of being told, the story of the current match. But it seems to me that there's these higher, more complex stories that are being built for mm -hmm. gamification, whether it's dealing with addiction or aging um, or learning. Um, and it seems to me that if we're going to, I mean, this is speculative again, but say in 20 years, if most of the things that we do have been gamified in some way, we're going to need storytellers to do that. And perhaps even though we think that the novel may be in decline and movie making may be in decline or at least in decline in, in terms of creating new and original pieces, we just seem to be regurgitating things. It's perhaps possible that storytelling may become a desired profession in the coming years yeah. because of gamification. Well, yeah. you've all know a Harari. From, yeah. I um, mean, in, in Sapiens lays this out and of course adds a dystopic spin on um, Homo Deus, which was his second book. Uh, that we think in terms of stories. And good teachers and good lecturers that you had in university were storytellers. Storytelling is what we do. It tries to organize the world into a meaningful progression. And storytelling has to contain conflict. So good storytelling is good game design. And the field of instructional design, which you know from my literature, I'm extremely critical of right now. Um, it's Some of its, its, its best designers are, are people with an English degree who are storytelling. Um, and storytelling is absent from a good deal of instructional design. Um, so I agree, yeah, I mean, storification would be the word I would use. And it's a very, very strong element. But there are so many elements that have to weave together in good gamification that far beyond the time we'd have on this podcast. But think of learning, game-based learning, as being a bicycle wheel. And the learning objectives and competencies are the spokes and the hub. And then the uh, are like the spokes. The wheel itself would be the um, game mechanics. And then the tire, the outer layer, would be the theme of the game. Mm -hmm. Is it set in ancient Greece? So what is the theme? And many educators will just theme it into simulation. So they say, well, you have a great idea about a steampunk ship in 2050 and people have to rescue a new world, but we're going to make it a virtual clinic in, in Scarborough. Toronto, you know. And you can change the tire pretty easily. You can change the tire easily. You can reskin the game. So you have to design the mechanics. Now, the tricky part here is that the mechanics have to link to the learning in a pretty nuanced and articulate way. 
um, where I've been critical of some of Carl Capp's earlier work, where he talked about developing pools of question banks, and that the games would be saw answering questions, and as you answered more questions correctly, you would hit a, a putt, and the putt would land in the green more effectively. So there were like little golf games, and the and, and, and the more things you get right, the bit more accuracy. The very ingenious concepts. This company called Exonify in Waterloo that did a good deal of this work. But if you look at a lot of these people, there hasn't been a lot of uptake on this kind of thing. Um, so in my game designs, I tend to use um, a lot of board game mechanics. I tend to learn from uh, role-playing games such as World of Warcraft and games which have a lot of people that follow them. And I try to say, why do so many people pay 30 bucks a month or 15 bucks a month to play this for 10 years? So that's got to have some traction. Here's a question for you. There's this, I guess it's not so new anymore, but people watching other people play games on a platform such as Twitch. So you'll have millions and millions of people not play, but watch other people play games. Now, there's a sporting element to this that I can understand. So people watch other people play Scar StarCraft because it's a game of real skill. And there's only a few people in the world who can play at the caliber of the, the amount of clicks per minute, for example, is so high. But their strategies and their understanding of the mechanics of the game, mm. that's like sports to me. But there are people who watch other people just play a game. And I wonder, I, I mean... I, I don't know, maybe this is speculative again, but why is that? And and is that still gaming? Are we gaming just through someone else, or is it a different reason for doing so? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, in the paramedic simulation work they do at Humber College, where they've spent over a hundred grand on a VR facility, which also includes uh, green background um, body movement capture sensors. They've done quite a bit of work on this. The, the Humber paramedic uh, facility uh, facilities are designed so that you can encounter post-traumatic... Uh, they're trying to treat PTSD in first responders and ambulance drivers. They have a high rate of suicide and addiction. It's hard to see that stuff all day and go home normal. Um, some do it, but a lot don't. So they introduced a casualty simulation of a subway car that had been blown up in a mass casualty and you have to run around and triage these people moaning so as you do that you're wearing the vr headset you're using an oculus or vive or rift and you've got headphones in so you're completely immersed it's called tethered vr untethered vr is when i send you to a website you put your cell phone in you put your cargo or gossels and you you can do it anywhere but tethered vr has these long cables that hook you up to an unreal kind of a computer engine so you can be wearing these goggles, treating these patients, and record it, or have hundreds of students seeing how you function in it. So you can be in the immersive tech with people observing how you function in immersive tech and learning from your experience. And that allows a good deal of empathizing, uh, or sort of mentalizing, and possibly empathizing behaviors. So it's there's kind of mirroring that's possible there. The newer VR communication systems that are being developed allow you and I to be in the same room and see each other in VR like a hologram. And that is going to produce an interactive component to virtual spaces. And virtual spaces to me are very interesting. There's a huge philosophical end of understanding virtual space. There's a course I teach. I'm starting in the fall. Again, I've taught it once. People quite liked it on hyperreality in the future. So hyperreality... Uh, was developed by someone named Jean Baudrillard. And Baudrillard was very interested in how we manipulate reality. So like a McDonald's hamburger is a hyper-real food. It's not really a food. Or Fanta soda is a hyper-real food. Um, runway models that you see airbrushed over in Vogue magazine are hyper-real. So this was his concern. He was kind of concerned with society's mistaking of their... So a hyper-real object is an object that has lost any connection to its real counterpart. It's actually... It was based on something in reality and became disconnected. So these hyper-real spaces in VR are kind of interesting, but it, it begs a bigger question of what is reality anyhow? Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson speculates that we are in a VR simulation, that that's actually what human life is. Mm -hmm. that advanced civilizations can do VR pretty damn good. And we're simply characters in their VR fantasy. In, in the Matrix, in perhaps. In the Matrix yeah. singularities. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, when you put that together with the work of Robert Lanza on biocentrism, and biocentrism is often confused in, by its reading that, uh, that all biology is important. Anthrocentrism is that human beings are important, yeah. not to screw the rest of reality. But biocentrism is a much deeper philosophical basis that we actually create and generate reality states. 
So if you're in VR experiencing reality, it's still the field of consciousness. Consciousness doesn't change. So you bring consciousness with you into the VR state. And consciousness is a field of experience. So we end up talking, in my work, I tend up talking about field properties of learning. So when I talk about learning now, I talk about it in terms of chaotic structures and, um, and big science and big data manipulation, um, much more than I talk about it, you know. I'll give you one example, um, a short one. You know, um, I was first starting to gamify in about 96, 97. I was at uh, Ryerson University. I was teaching a lot of biology. My background is in neuroscience and physiology. And I had a student from Palestine who had been a soldier in this Jordanian army. And he'd seen a lot of stuff in his day. And he'd come to Canada to build a better life for himself. And I used to smoke cigarettes at the time, so I would go outside with him and have a cigarette, and then we would just talk. I thought he was Italian. I couldn't make out the accent. And eventually the story comes out. So he got maybe a C- minus in my first course, which we taught through lectures and that. So then I did a complete gamification where the whole course was a term-long game. It was a, it was a role-playing game of like being a doctor, but there was a whole fantasy about rescuing people, and I had ability cards and power-ups and a whole complex system. And so he took that course, and he got a B+. Plus. So because he'd been a medic in the Jordanian army, when you get into small groups and they had medical case simulations, everyone looked at him and said, well, what the hell do we do? He said, well, you start an IV, you check pupils. So I couldn't have predicted that when I designed the game, nor that I could predict that the people that objected to the game most of all, which were a group of very granola e midwife students, you know, the type that are more organic and think that games are kind of something you do in the basement when you're a warped adolescent. They said, we don't like this game. And I said, well, forget about it being a game. You want to help babies. All term, I'm just going to give you cases where you help sick children and babies. Just save them and forget about the game. And they won the game. Hmm. So emergent properties. Andrzej Markowski talks a lot about emergent games. Games should allow, in this, in this context, for emergent behaviors. That's why people like Monopoly. You're not sure how each game is going to go. Or when you get into World of Warcraft, you don't know because you're dealing with other players. And you're fighting them or you're working with them on a dungeon and it takes six weeks and you've got personalities. People don't show up, etc. So, you know, I think we want to dig a little deeper. Kind of like life, really. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. the more representative of life, almost the more game-like, I guess, it can feel, which is odd. But, but just to go back to this idea that we're all living in a simulation, obviously it's something impossible to prove. Like it's impossible to prove that there is or isn't a god, for example. It's almost the same order of questioning really. Um, Elon Musk, to go back to him, said that, you know, there's a, a one in a billion chance that we're living in base reality. Because within a few years in our own current reality, it's only a matter of time before we're able to create a simulation that is indistinguishable from reality. Um, I'm also glad that you brought up Yuval Noah Harari. You're the first person on the podcast to bring it up without me doing so first. So thank you. Um, and this whole idea of story and storytelling is so powerful in in his writing and in his view of the world and even though it's kind of a once you read it you realize well of course of course story is the basic currency of our species that's how we relate that's how we build relationships we do it through narrative and story and to go back to this idea of story and gaming it seems to me that whether it's monopoly or chess or a game of cards or whatever we're telling stories as we go and it's iterative to use that word that you used earlier and I find this just a really fascinating concept. And I wonder, to go to this idea of story, what's your story? Why? It seems to me, sitting across from you, that you're really passionate about this stuff. I don't know if that's because you've, you've played games yourself or, or it, it, it's something that you discovered later. But there's a real passion in this for you. And I just wonder why. Where does that come from? It, to be absolutely frank, it comes from my interest in altered states of consciousness and the fact that default mode for human living is based very much on a lot of drives and personal hierarchies hierarchies, and identity politics. And something kind of terrifying is happening with identity politics right now. Um, and that we need disruptors for that. And I'm interested in disruptive processes. 
um, in that uh, enabling people to experience reality in new ways to reconceptualize the world or experience a new identity. Too. Yeah. Well, well, identity politics is something that I, I've written. I, there's a Canadian author, Jordan Peterson, who's well known all over the world as best selling books. And he's a polarizing figure because people misunderstand his work. And in fact, I've written two articles in the National Post, uh, very critical of Jordan Peterson's work and his followers and its assumptions. Um, but there's something that I believe that he's very right about. And in fact, I'm, I may be writing an article saying why I think Jordan Peterson is right. Identity politics has um, been embraced by both the right and the left. And in the left, it's query insidious. And it's, I'm in a university environment and I'm socially liberal, but they've gone too far. Um, they've gone to the point where um, you begin to divide people on the basis of their ideologies and their identities. So when you say, I'm fighting for the marginalized and I'm black, because you're black, you now represent all black people who have ever lived, which is preposterous. You could be, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, or you could be Muhammad Ali, or you could be some gangster guy, or you could be some ball player, or... I mean, you don't... Well, it's like saying that just because you're white, you must have some a ability to represent Adolf Hitler or Joseph well, Stalin. Well, that's it. I mean, because you're white, you're now, you know, really the problem. And then the, the, the uh, reconciliation on indigenous rights, that there's an offense. If you say Canada Day, you're offending First Nations. And it, it prompted me to really, uh, again, look at this fact that each identity group is claiming some space. So Black Lives Matter interrupted the gay pride parade and wouldn't let it continue two years ago in Toronto. So now two marginalized groups are fighting and the only way they were able to allow the parade to continue because Black Lives Matter blocked it, let's lay it on the ground and said no parade for you until our rights are recognized by police. So gay pride said, okay, what are your demands to let the parade? And he said, our demands are no more uniform cops, no more cops in the pride parade because you're not good to our community and we don't want you having a voice piece. So pride went along with it. And so to this, even to this day, even this pride, the police were not allowed to participate in the parade. So here you have these identity groups all fighting to say, listen to me, listen to me. And then you have concepts like cultural appropriation, which is that you can't do yoga, teach it, unless you're Hindu. And at Carleton, I believe, it were, or it was Ottawa, I think it was Carleton, there was a white yoga instructor who was banned from teaching yoga because she wasn't Hindu. But what if your mother's Hindu and you lived in Brampton, Ontario? You're born of Hindu parents, but you don't follow it. You don't know anything about it. You're kind of a hip-hop artist. So you can do yoga, but I can't. So, And then on the right... We all are well aware of the alarming rise of proto-fascist thinking and the Trump um, area and misandries and misogynies, and these are well documented. So there's, to there's poison on each end of the river. The left have gone absolutely crazy to the point that I no longer consider myself left. I can't identify with shutting down dialogue on the basis of ideology and parsing every comment for trigger words, nor can I support... Um, a kind of anti-scientific um, kind of, uh, you know, white power structure uh, and supremacy. These are both hideous. So in the middle, disruptive processes to me are unifying what we, I would call depolarizing actions. And depolarization is me getting inside your head as a Trump voter and saying, okay, I understand why you would go that way. If you're an NRA gun owner and I don't like guns, I get inside your head and you're feeling like, you know, if they come into my school, and try to hurt my kids, I'm going to take them out. Now, that's just one process of depolarizing. And my last comment on that would be psychedelic experience. That the work that's going on now with ayahuasca, with DMT, and microdosing. Microdosing is huge. I haven't tried it yet. Um, but microdosing is using very low doses of either ecstasy or LSD or psilocybin. Not enough to get you high, but enough to improve mental clarity and focus. And it's being used by a lot of millennials right now who are not going to confess it. They're getting LSD and um, psilocybin and peyote online. They're doing a small dose of it. Because these 5-TH2A receptors in parts of the brain are able to move us into more what I would call mystical places. There's another course I teach on mysticism. I teach it every three or four years. And mystical practice has a disruptor function. You can get out of ordinary consciousness and see the world in new ways and reframe. And this reframing is important because even if we're not taking microdosing, um, there is a happiness generator in the cortex.
So a specific region of the brain, we're not sure where it is, but functionally it exists. And that is you imagine what the world will be like if you got that Mercedes. And so you imagine yourself in the Mercedes feeling all right. And so we use that experience, that happiness simulator. So a lot of what happens in us is imagining how things can be and then and then moving toward those targets to satisfy that urge. And of course, you discover once you're there that the Mercedes has electrical problems and, and you've spent all your money and now you've got a $700 a month car payment, etc. <laughs> so psychedelic experience is why, what drives me in gamification. I'm interested in people losing touch with what we call ordinary reality and experiencing non-ordinary states of consciousness where there's a feeling of unity and love and wisdom and all the stuff the great teachers have taught us over the centuries, I believe lies in the game world. And the game world is just beginning to bridge that. Otherwise, the game world can become, at the worst, at, you know, at the least, a trivialization in, 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 uh, of learning, and at its worst, an insidious Chinese communist uh, you know, social credit system which is currently be developed uh, being developed Indians. which is really really yeah, scary yeah black mirror yeah black mirror yeah um yeah i mean what you said is really fascinating and i think another i another and correct me if, if i'm wrong but another form of disruption today is having a conversation like this i mean you kind of mentioned it getting inside of an nra person's head uh and and understand and having them understand where you think but it goes both ways i also have to understand where they're coming from and empathize and mentalize with their notion of the world and risk the fact that I may be changed. One of the things that I promise every guest with this podcast is that by the end of this conversation, I may be a different person with a different perspective yes. of the world. And I hope that you would, you would do the same. And the Bruce Lee said he taught martial arts because how it changed people. And we mm. agree it's that change that's important. Yeah, yeah. And that's, change is important yeah. in a story. In any story, any good story, a person changes from beginning to end. Even if they don't change physically, they've changed emotionally or and mentally. Th and there's something else that's important. I play World of Warcraft pretty faithfully. It's, it's part of a therapy. I'm very much like Jane McGonigal in that I have a disability and World of Warcraft is part of my treatment plan. Mm -hmm. And that's what it does now. In the past, it was a game. It's become, uh, it has certain regulatory functions for me. But there's people in the guild that I work with, with all different uh, pathological affiliations and different races you don't know because you're just playing i look right. like a cow and they look like a you know a, a troll so i don't know that they're black or white or in between but when we're playing the game it kind of unites us in something common and we see each other every day and our lives progress someone has migraines someone has a death in the family that's related in guild chat or discord so there's something about being immersed in something common together where we are focused on the task in front of us and not on who we are. And you find out who you are, you know, it's like a good first date. It's probably going to do something rather than sitting and trying to talk for three hours over wine. Well, right. And what you do can change and therefore identity can be fluid. I can, today, I can go on to World of Warcraft and be an orc, but tomorrow I might be a human. And in any game, I mean, I'm, that's, that might be a cliche that's example. That's absolutely but brilliant. I love that you, the way you phrase that. Very good. Well, because, thank you. Because what's happening in Gen Z is that identities are fluid. Uh, Chloe, Chloe Grace Moretz, who played mm -hmm. uh, Hit Girl and um, uh, what was it, um, Kick Ass, um, she talks about her morning ritual, which consists of some Islamic and, and some Christian and some Buddhist r rituals. Young people, Gen Zers, um, are fluid with gender. Um, I know someone whose name was Amy, who changed it to Ellie because it could be Ellie or Elliot, and they're kind of in between. There's pan gender states pansexual states bisexuality um, different uh, forms gender queer uh, gender queer is a category of men who really prefer the intimacy of a relationship with a woman in terms of connection but they don't feel sexual attraction to women so they're not really bisexual they really prefer to be in a committed relationship because they like female energy but there's not anything sexually going on so that's gender queer these 26 pronoun states so the fluidity of identity that occurs in online spaces should be happening in our lives as well well and maybe it's seeping in maybe that's exactly <laughs> maybe, you know maybe yeah. that's precisely or part of why there's such fluidity in gen z is because there's such influence from the online or the gaming world that's a fascinating question I know that the research on games, and there's a huge literature research on video game neurophysiology. So there's the gamification research. It's not as robust. You can imagine there's hundreds of papers on 
So, for example, violent video games produce um, permanent structural changes in the occipital cortex and, and the hippoc and, and, and hippocampal formation. I mean, this has been documented time and time again. There's higher neuron structures. So you desensitize. You see blood on the screen. It doesn't bug you after a while. But in a 10-year study in, in, in competitive video games who played violent games, looking at altruism and empathy, it was unchanged. So even though we're, that's the thing about neuroplasticity is being a, dang, a slippery slope, there are neuroplastic changes that make violence more acceptable to see, but it doesn't seem to produce any. In fact, what they found in the study was many people had altruistic encounters. I'm a newbie in a first-person shooter, and I'm dying every two seconds on your team. And some guy gets on with you and, on the headphones, and it's okay, dude. You've got to hide behind these barrels. Let me help you out. There were actually incidents of people swapping teams. And going over to the other side and saying, I was mind controlling you the whole time. Get in the forums. They said, yeah, you bastard. You had mind control. You're controlling my character. <laughs> so he said, well, next time I'll play Alliance. You can get me back. So that actually in, within the competition and within these game structures, even where there's desensitization to violence, there were altruistic human behaviors occurring. Yeah. So the game world seemed to allow us things, access to things. Um, but smartphones do, but... They are a very different phenomena. So all digital technologies are not created equal. And there's not a hierarchy of, oh, smartphones, bad, games, good. There's a, a blended, and I wouldn't even say a continuum. There's a tapestry of digital experiences. And I'm trying to tap into those things that seem most effective. But as you can understand, when the rubber hits the road, there are all kinds of systemic things, budgets and timelines, expectations and recruiting, innovation, Rogers innovation cycle basics. I'm doing some fascinating work um, right now we've, we, where we've, we're producing gamified simulations in the insurance industry. And insurance doesn't sound all that interesting. And when they've been teaching it a lot by doing lectures for eight hours and then writing exams. And they know something's wrong. But it's a, and then you imagine as they go to online, you get the online version of that. But actually, insurance is interesting. So you start learning the basis of insurance with a case like this. Uh, you're trying to insure a cannabis a dispensary. They've come to you for insurance and liability or a cannabis grow operation. How do you insure that? Uh, how do you write up insurance policies in view of climate change? The insurance industry this last quarter lost money across Canada because of climate change. It's a major issue. Insurance is pretty fast. There's somebody that's done gamified accounting. Hmm. And that's how could you make an accounting interesting? So it's a historical game. And you start it with the abacus and you've got goats and pigs and you want a dog. And how many goats and pigs do I have to give you to get one dog? The dog will help me hunt and it'll pick up problems coming onto my property. Well, it's going to take 100 goats and pigs. Well, let's keep track of it. Then there was the Saldieni, who are the Muslim um, um, sandalwood inspectors in the 6th century. And they would inspect goods coming from the Far East to make sure that you're not getting burned on myrrh or sandalwood, the Saldieni. So there's these different kinds of ways that you could teach something like accounting um, to make it fascinating. Once you add storification and historical context... Um, things which seem rather mundane suddenly connect with our experience. So imagination in game design is important. And I think that would lead into another topic for another time maybe. And that is how do you become, how do you enter this space? And I would say one simple thing that we've done again and again and students love is we get a WordPress blog or a simple LMS. Each week you put a few case studies and the case studies can be three or four sentences. Hi, a 32-year-old man is coming in with wrist pain. Like, that's their case. It's fine. You, or you want to put in 10 pages with x-rays? Up to you. And you host those on your LMS or on your WordPress blog. And so they pick the case they want. And it awards them a certain amount of points. And if they do all three, they get more points. And then once you've done those, then next week the cases are a little harder. And you just keep going through solving cases. And by the time six to eight weeks have gone by, you, then you have a boss fight. And the boss fight, it'd be what we call a triple jump, where we present something on the case. You have to make a decision in a limited period of time. We have timers on it, beep, 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 really annoying timers to push your cortisol levels up. And then we have a dice roll. And we set a probability range in the dice roll because you can set probabilities. You could say anything between a 3 and a 10 is a good roll so that you can get 70, 80, 90% chance of success or drop it down to 30. So they roll the dice and they see what happens. Because just like the real world, when you give an antidepressant out, only 66% of the time are you going to see response in the first antidepressant you used. But if you use a bad gamified model, oh, the patient had depression. Oh, I gave them antidepressant. Now right. they're all better. That's so, default mode thinking. Yeah. So yeah. what we do is we use throw the dice to give you. So we set it at a 66% chance roll 
then you can get any of these tables. So you hit it uh, there. And so that they run on and they say, okay, that's good. So now we go to the next part of them. Okay, you're given the medication and it's been okay. Now the patient is developing suicidal ideations two weeks later and has uh, done some self-harm. Okay, now you have to figure out a solution to that. Roll the dice, see how that went. And finally, stage of the boss fight is, okay, here's the third part of the case. You discover also that they have diabetes and that they have this other thing that you have to co-manage. All right, let's roll the dice, see it. And when they get the dice rolls clear and they've come up with three solutions, that teaches resiliency. It teaches them to adapt to the real world. Uh, that's what resiliency would be, that get up and go again and re-alter. And it makes it exciting because you don't know how the dice is going to tumble. It that gives you a burst of excitement when you get the good roll. And it, it capstones everything you've done in cases. So we're getting to what you have in video games where you get to the final boss in the dungeon. So you can do all that with a WordPress blog and a little bit of R&D time. And then when you do it online, you create a discussion forums and where people go into the group and you create time limited. So, you know, you work with these elements. So these are really, really effective ways to teach. And the thing that you learn when you start teaching this way is it's, it comes back to problem-based learning. You probably don't get as many facts. But you learn how to think. Yeah, well, you get the facts on the job. But this is what I'm thinking: that in real life, it's a dice roll. In real life, I don't know what situation I'm going to come across. But if I read it in textbooks, in a textbook, then I know that A solves B, which comes from C. And and it's not like that. Or it can be. Maybe 66% of the time that it is. Anyways, I've got one final thing for you, David, for sure. uh, before we close up. And it's, it's something that I'm doing that's new. I've got 10 things, and I'm going to get you rea to react to them sure. quickly. Um, brevity is a gift with this one. So um, first of all, I want some of these words have to do with th some of the research I did on you before this podcast and the articles that you've written. And you did actually refer to it, which I'm really glad of, because the way that I found you was an article that you wrote um, about uh, Trump, Doug Ford, and Jordan Peterson and the end of rational thinking. Uh, and I didn't realize when I read that that your whole shtick is gamification and virtual reality and, and health. Um, and once I realized that, I'm like, oh, I don't want to talk about Jordan Peterson. I want to talk about that stuff. <laughs> so I'm glad we did both. Uh, but here are the 10 things. I'm just going to go one at a time and as quickly as you can, what's your reaction? So, David, the first one is artificial intelligence. Uh, we don't have it yet. Uh, there aren't neural networks that are sophisticated. I wouldn't put too much stock in it right now unless you're a developer. Okay. Second one is democracy. Gamifications enable true democracies. But true democracy is probably not voting, but letting people that know the most about the subject make decisions. Mm. Third one is globalization. Terrifying. Fourth one is learning. Fundamental human biology. Fifth one is solitaire. Painful. <laughs> Sixth one is chess. Painful. Seven, world building. What we should be doing. Eight, privacy. Essential, terrifying if it's lost. Aging. Wisdom. And addiction. What are you addicted to? <laughs> I think, not, honestly... Not, yeah, I mean. Yeah, we're no. all hooked on something. Let's, yeah. let's look at the Buddhist idea of karma and attachment. That thinking and life is an addiction. And addiction is just an amplification of our attachment to things. Should we go between Kalapas? There are, according to the Buddhists, it's a good ending thought... There are 17 million mind moments per second. And in between mind moments, what they saw Satchitananda, these kind of particles of consciousness, there's what they call shunyata or emptiness or void. And in Aikido and in Qigong and ancient martial arts, they try to step between the mind moments into the void space. And so I think it's very interested. That's kind of mindfulness. So mindfulness-based approaches, I think, are where we want to be moving. And that if games help improve mindfulness-based approaches, we can then enter these altered states of reality where we're in connectedness and we're giving up on attachments to things and being fully present in the moment. That's really hard to do. It's really hard to do because I think, as you said, addiction is everywhere and almost everything. Um, David, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been really illuminating for me and, and, and really fun, too. So thank you. Thank you for a great interview that allowed us to probe some of the deeper issues yeah. that I think are much more germane than how to build a cool learning game. To learn more about David Chandros, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous episodes, as well as a way to get in touch with me to let me know what you think of this conversation or any other. Now, your quote of the week is from Jane McGonigal, author of Reality is Broken, Why Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World. It goes... 
A game is an opportunity to focus our energy with relentless optimism at something we're good at or getting better at and enjoy. In other words, gameplay is the direct emotional opposite of depression. Next week, my guest is Jacqueline Cardinal, Managing Director of Nehawan in Edmonton, Alberta, and we talk about being and becoming Indigenous. I'll see you then. <laughs>